This week on the Cameron Journal Podcast, I am so excited to talk to Letitia Brown, Dr. Letitia Brown, matter of fact. She and I were acquaintances in college. We did some fun stuff together on diversity council and that sort of thing. And today we're going to talk about black feminism, because if your feminism is not intersectional, it's not real feminism. So we're going to dive into that. We're going to have a fascinating conversation about diversity, feminism, and women's issues. It's a great conversation. I kind of talked too much because I wanted to talk to her so bad about this, but she gives us some great information and some great action plans of how we can assist black feminists in getting the rights and the privileges that they deserve in our society and help us all build a more equitable society for all. All right, it's the Cameron Shaw Podcast with Dr. Letitia Brown. Let's go. This is the Cameron Journal Podcast. It's a place where we talk about important things. It's a place where we bring a little slice of the news to you. And it's a place where we do important things, have important conversations. It's also things that I like to talk about. My name is Cameron Cowan, and this is the Cameron Journal Podcast. Today on the Cameron Journal Podcast, I am pleased to have a conversation with Dr. Letitia Brown. We are going to be covering some of the finer points of feminism, black feminism, what's missing from the feminist movement, and why in 2021, if your feminism is not intersectional, it's not real feminism. Welcome, Dr. Brown. How are you today? Doing well. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. I'm glad someone is doing well between... (laughs) Uh, the coup and the second impeachment and everything. Yeah. I am tired. I am wired. I've been on the phone consoling people. <laughs> yes. It's, it's been a little nuts. It's been a little nuts this week. But um, yes. Yeah, so, but we're going we're gonna to leave Mr. Trump and his issues behind for five minutes. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and we're going to talk about some things that actually matter. Um, not um, <laughs> and we're going to talk about um, a little bit, a little bit about feminism. So this past summer we had a lot of movement in racial justice, all this type of thing. Mm-hmm. So as we dive into all of that, why don't you give us a little bit of background? on yourself, your work, and what you do, because you do a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I do. So walk us through a little bit of that, and then we'll dive into unwinding feminism. Sounds good. So my name is Dr. Letitia Brown, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Virginia Tech. I have a bachelor's degree in Africana Studies from the University of Northern Colorado, and a master's and PhD in sociology from the University of Texas at Austin. Ooh, those are dogs, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. It, it, we're still in the quarantine and the pandemic. Dogs are allowed. <laughs> it's true, it's true. They keep you calm. Yes. My research primarily focuses along the lines of the sociology of sport, critical food studies, and black girlhoods. And the underlying thread between everything that I do, research, teaching, and service is Black feminism. That is my core as a scholar and my core as a human being. Excellent. Well, that's excellent because (laughs) I want to find out, it's 2021. Yes. We've had, you know, 60 years kind of since second wave feminism and the, the the real kind of thing I wanna I wanna get to and discuss around is there has been a criticism, and I think rightly so, over the last several years, that in all the work that has been done in feminism, women of color, particularly black women, kind of got left behind. Right. This happens in American society. Kind <laughs> um, kind of got, got left behind. So how do you think black feminism differs from its white counterpart. Oh, well, (laughs) so black feminism in the U.S. really emerged alongside, you know, the first wave feminist movement and or the second wave of feminism and the um, black power movement. 
And the reason for this is that Black women needed a space in which they could tackle the intersecting issues of both racism and sexism, which is something that is often left out of mainstream feminism. While mainstream feminists were trying to get out into the workplace, Black women have been in the workplace since they were brought over as indentured servants and later as enslaved individuals. And then even through Jim Crow, through the civil rights movements, Black women have always worked. And so the issues that Black women have were not necessarily the same issues that white women have. And so there's always this conversation around, you know, the... Um, the 19th Amendment in which women won the right to vote. <laughs> and it's always so interesting every time this happens and people often forget that it wasn't all women, you know, it was white women. And I think that that's kind of where the disconnect comes is that there is no essential woman. So there is no, there are no essential problems that are specific to, you know, that you can just put in a box and say, these are the things that all women face. It doesn't exist. And so what is important about Black feminism that goes back to our foremothers of the Kumbahi River Collective is that Black feminists are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression. And they do so, you know, with the idea that these major systems of oppression are interlocking. And so we see it as a political movement that is here to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. And so the party line essentially is that if black women were free, all women would be free, all people would be free, everyone, because it would mean dismantling all of the dominant systems of oppression. You know, that, that absolutely, that absolutely makes, makes total sense. I, <clears throat> I guess the thing that I find interesting or odd is there seems to be this conflict between kind of, I guess we'll call it mainstream feminism. Right. I should have come up with a better term for that. <laughs> um, between like mainstream feminism and feminism as it happens in communities of, of color. I mean, how many videos have been produced where so many black women have said, feminism does not really apply to me. Right. Or it doesn't really, you know, it's, it's just kind of not here for me sort of thing. Um, and I think a lot of your maybe well-meaning but not educated white feminists would say, no, 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 we've done all this work and, right. you know, pay gap and all this sort of thing. And this right. applies to, to everyone and all this sort of thing. <laughs> but it doesn't, so, not equally, because there is a gender pay gap. But if you don't look at that pay gap on the basis of race as well, you're missing the larger picture. Yeah, and I, and I, and I guess that's what I, I guess that, that's kind of the next follow on thing of, what would you say to well-meaning, but perhaps not as informed white feminists about how their work doesn't necessarily translate to community of color, to communities of color? Why do you think that is? Where, where's the cliff where it falls mm -hmm. off? So there's this common understanding that, you know, black people and people of color in general have to know about whiteness because we live in a world that is structured by whiteness and white supremacy. On the flip side, white people don't necessarily have to know about the lived experiences of black people or other people of color in order to navigate the world in which they live. I would dare say most don't and don't care. They don't, and they don't care. And so that's kind of where the disconnect happens. Like if you're not interested in engaging with the reality that there are fundamental differences because of white supremacy, because of the legacies of genocide and enslavement, then you're missing the truth. And you'll never be no, able to yeah. contend with what, what the actual problems are. <sighs> Well, what do you, I mean, I guess then that, I guess then that, that begs the question, what do black women face that's unique from their white counterparts? Mm. Well, definitely racism. 
um, definitely sexism that's shaped by racism because, you know, there are these varying ideas that Black women are constantly, constantly critiqued for our bodies, no matter what shape or size we are. And there's always this, like, underlying belief, concern, critique that all Black women are essentially men. If you think about Michelle Obama and the constant conversations that people had about her arms and her body and the fact that people referred to her as Michael continuously trying to say that she wasn't indeed a woman, but what does even that mean in general? Is that our ideas about sex, gender, and sexuality are really, you know, confined by these binaries that don't exist because it's a spectrum. But right. these are challenges that are unique to Black women. And if we think about Patricia Hill Collins and her work on controlling images, like women that struggle with poverty are all faced with hardship, but white poverty is not pathologized in the way that black poverty is. When people say welfare queens, there's a specific image that that term conjures and it's black women. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Right. Yes, thank you, Ronald right. Reagan. Right, and like <laughs> starting that, the yeah. Moynihan report. And so there are these things that black women have to contend with that other women of color don't and that white women don't. And so like there are very specific kind of ideas about women that are tied to their racial identities, right? Like there's this idea of the docile, Asian American woman or the sexy Latina, like there are very specific tropes for women. And if we don't understand that these are unique experiences, then we're just flattening the curve, but not in and a good way, yes, not in like the way that we want it to be flattened, of course, like with COVID. Yes. And, and that gets me into the Aunt Jemima controversy. Right. Because as much as I appreciate not seeing racism on the baking aisle at the grocery <laughs> store, um, and although I haven't been to a grocery store in eight months because of the pandemic, right. but um, on my app, I don't have to see it on my app anymore. Um, I, I feel like, and I, I would like to get your opinion on this, I feel like that stuff's low-hanging fruit. It's like, okay, yes, we'll get rid of the Aunt Jemima pancake syrup, right. and we should probably have a conversation about Uncle Ben's rice right. and all this sort of thing. But re really, we're going for the low-hanging right. fruit. Like, this is the minimum requirement. Exactly. We could, we could and should be doing right. more. Right. It's representational <laughs> as opposed to fundamental change, like tackling the fact that the largest growing prison population is Black women, and that the people that are being murdered on the streets the most are Black trans women. And so it's like, but we're going to go after, you know, Aunt Jemima because that's easy and it's symbolic as opposed to really digging our heels into these problems that are central to the world in which we live and that are affecting people's lives financially, you know, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think it's interesting that conversely, while all of those things are going on, the population that is now getting the most bachelor's degrees and becoming the most educated is also black right. women. So it's so you have these very interesting trends going on at the same time. time. Exactly. It's very like yeah. both and. We don't live in an either or society. It's a both and. You know, you can both experience joy and pain simultaneously. Like they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. No. That of, of course that makes complete, you know, kind of common, common sense. It's just interesting to, I'm someone who tracks trends mm -hmm. and I, I do a fairly decent job of predicting the future on things. <laughs> I have never gotten a prediction on Medicare for all right. I thought that would have happened already and I'm still waiting and I thought it would have happened 10 years ago. Um, but I, I, when I, I look at trends and things in society, it is very interesting that on the one hand you have a series of very bad kind of things happening and going on, while conversely, you have this one really good thing going right. on that's going to pay generational dividends because when you educate women, they will educate their children. Exactly. 
educate a woman and you educate generations of people. So it's kind of a very interesting thing from a trend line perspective of, you know, these things are all kind of happening at, at once. And then you start having a conversation about access yes. and economics and all that sort of thing. Um, that, that's, that's very interesting. So let's dive into the Black Lives Matter thing of, of the mm-hmm. summer. I have my own ideas about what happened over the hmm. summer, but I want to hear yours first. <laughs> Give me your kind of, your own view of what happened this summer mm. and what was great about it, what was not great about it. How do we go forward from mm. here? Whew, this was a rough, a rough summer. It was a rough summer. If we, But it's also yes. like, it's not the first rough summer. It's... No. Not just, even close. Not, not even, even this, this decade. decade. And that's, that's like <laughs> no, one of yeah. the things is that it was like this moment in which everything was coming to a head because not only are we in the midst of a global pandemic in which many of us are self-isolating, but we're having these instances back to back of vivid and violent murders. And yes. all of that happening simultaneously, knowing that the you know white supremacist in chief is who he is just made everything come to a head for lack of a better term and for me it was (laughs) horrifying to watch and to know that my friends were out there on the front lines in places like wisconsin and chicago being you know arrested and assaulted by the police for standing up for the belief that, you know, black people are one, inherently human and that our lives have value and that people seem to take issue with that. Like, why is that even an issue? Like if that's the fundamental tenet, but of course we wanna frame Black Lives Matter as though it is the terrorist, you know, organization. When in reality, if you knew anything about the movement and what it stands for, it's about asserting the fundamental right of black people to exist. Period. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, and and the, and the thing I I take because I mean people you know it kind of it came to a head this summer but people don't realize that that term is even before the summer was around for about at least uh, that I know of two years before. Oh yeah, that. I mean, and I say this because yeah because when I lived here last before I moved and left and came mm-hmm. back. You know, dear listener, if you don't know about my various movings, CameronJournal.com, go read. Um, I got in an argument with one of my coworkers because it, I live in Seattle, so there are Black Lives Matter signs everywhere. And someone was like, oh, I really wish that that said, you know, all lives matter. And I kind of very nicely, kindly explained why, no, that sign says exactly what it right. means to Um, for a very specific reason, because we have a very specific problem. There is a very specific group of people that are being killed by authority, and we need to address that. Um, And that conversation happened in the summer of 2018. Mm -hmm. So that was predated 2020 by two years. And the... I guess, guess, and you probably would know this better Mm -hmm. than I do, is what is the block that people have about acknowledging this police brutality problem and acknowledging black people are people, human beings, just like Mm -hmm. them with children, thoughts, problems, concerns, all this sort of thing. What's the disconnect? (laughs) How do like, how, how was, how have people not figured this out yet? Like it's been 50 years since Martin Luther King. People have had time like to grow up with this at this point. Where's the disconnect? What are people we People don't want to, one, pay for the sins of their fathers, as they say. They also that don't want true. to acknowledge that they benefit from those sins. They want to believe that we live in a meritocracy because that's the party line of the USA is that, you know, everybody here can build themselves up by their bootstraps. But it's a very difficult thing to do if you don't have shoes in the first place. And not everybody has shoes in this country so like it's not a thing that we want to acknowledge it's not a thing that people are comfortable saying but i think that like for some people who live without this understanding 
that January 6th kind of brought that to a head for them. And they kind of like, it was a watershed moment in which hopefully they began to realize that there is a problem because these people, these white supremacists entered the Capitol building without a single shot being fired. Yet a 12 year old boy who had a toy gun was murdered. A 20 something EMT was shot to death in her home. And what are the differences between these incidences is that one included a mob of white people and the others were murders of black people who were unarmed. And, but we don't want to contend with that. We don't want to deal with that. We don't want to reckon with the fact that, you know, the black lives matter movement was started in 2013 as a response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the murder of Trayvon Martin. We don't want to talk about how there is this continued and perpetual black death because we've become so desensitized to it because it's happening all of the time, everywhere. Yes. <clears throat> now, there's kind of this... <clears throat> I think the six was a mm-hmm. watershed moment for a lot of people and for a lot of reasons and right. for a lot of things. And, I, and yes, and what I... I, on that point, what I laugh about the most is I had the fear right, right away. And I took to Twitter and said, guys, we almost lost the yep. country today. You all should be freaking out. Why you're not, right? Why like, why aren't you terrified? And I, and I laughed because the only people who were at my level mm-hmm. of panic were all oh, people yeah. of color. Mostly black women, matter of factly. Like even other dudes were not were just kind of like, oh, this was I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Democracy almost died today and we all should be scared. Right. Very, right. very scared. Um, and it's it's taken a couple of days, but like as time has gone on and more stuff has come out, people are finally beginning to reach the level of panic that I was mm-hmm. at the whole time. <laughs> and it I just found it very interesting that it seemed like only those of us Ooh. with brown skin were able to read the room and be like, oh, no, this is bad. <laughs> like, this but is it's not like good. You know, James Baldwin <laughs> said, you know, friends. that to be black and conscious is to be in a rage <laughs> almost all the time. And so it's like, you know, that's my default setting is worry, panic, and yeah. rage. That's the default. So while the sixth was troubling, I wasn't surprised. I was only surprised because I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. I really, I really thought that it was going to happen in 2016, to be quite honest. I was surprised that it took as long as it did. Yeah, I think that, that was, I guess, where kind of the difference, you know. I obviously come from a very different cultural background because I happen to be a brown person raised yes. in a very white world. And I didn't learn how to be black until I went to college. (laughs) And a bunch of y'all were kind of like, oh, honey, (laughs) we need to teach you everything. Every, every, everything. Um, And yes, and that's, you know, and and thank God for that because I was 18 and had no clue. Um, But I, yeah, that I mean, that kind of makes sense. But no, I really thought that I thought this sort of thing would happen one day, but I, it wouldn't happen for yeah. many decades. So I think my level of panic was like, oh, that happened 30 years sooner than I thought it would. <laughs> no, that's not it's good. not. <laughs> it's like, terrifying. That's, you know, yeah. It is. It is, absolutely. But that, that's... So to, to that, there's a lot of comparisons being mm-hmm. made right now between the incidences on January 6th and the protests Mm -hmm. over the summer. We had the CHOP zone here in Seattle. They nearly burned Portland to the ground, all this sort of thing. And there are a lot of glad ending white people who are saying, well, where was the outrage over what happened over the summer? (laughs) Sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And and, and I've I've not... I've not had time to process all of that and define the differences. That's yeah, why we I mean, have you. There are these... <laughs> Walk us through what was different about the sixth over the BLM. There were so the many stark contrasts, right? And if you take Twitter or Instagram yes. and you see these images of police in the summer holding guns in the face of children, whereas on the sixth, yes. you have police opening the gates to let the people into the Capitol. 
<laughs> these are very, very yes. different instances. Like in one instance, people are fighting for their right to exist and to live as human beings. And the other, they're fighting against madness and lies and trying to destroy what limited democracy exists. And on the basis of lies uh, from a madman and being riled up to kind of enact the deepest, darkest, you know, not, not fears, but like the core of their humanity, like the things that they want to do, but they only do in the darkness of night. I think someone said on Twitter the other day that all of the people that are being arrested right now are beginning to understand why their grandparents wore hoods. And yes. so, like, therein lies the difference. Yeah. No, no, I, I, that's, no, I mean, that, that is a good, a good, a good difference. It's just that I haven't come up with a good counter argument to all those complaining about, you know, destroyed businesses and burnt property and, and all this sort of thing, other than to say, it always seems in our society that we value buildings and property and businesses far more than we, we do like people. The charges against and the officer, if we solved one we but would we solve wouldn't the other. like the officer charged yeah. in the brianna taylor murder was charged with wanton endangerment for the bullets that went into the apartment next door not into her actual living body that is a problem yes because black lives are not yes. as valued as property in this country and that is a problem and that is the difference and until we contend with that fact, we're never going to be able to move forward. And then that's why I always say when it comes to tackling a problem like racism or poverty, and when I, when I wrote my essay on racism in, in my book, I, and towards the end I said, at one point you can't talk about racism without talking about oh, class in this definitely. country. They start to run into each other at some point. And so I always say, if you, if you solve the, if you treat this disease and not merely mollify the symptoms, these problems start to resolve themselves in terms of, you know, if you treat the sources of poverty, it fixes all sorts of problems, education, various mm -hmm. and sundry protests, all this sort of thing, things, you know, it sort of raises all boats, all boats and improves all things. And somehow <clears throat> in our society, <clears throat> And I don't understand why this is so difficult to understand. Somehow, when we start to try to address the issues that are going on in the black community mm -hmm. and start to say, well, if we solve this poverty problem, we'll solve mm -hmm. this education problem. If we solve this education problem, will we then solve mm -hmm. this crime problem? These things follow on like a train. I've gotten called racist. Because people don't understand what that. racism is. Um, <laughs> Yes, and I'm, and I'm kind of like, it's like, well, if I'm, if I'm racist, then we have many, many problems. Um, and I don't understand why so many people have an issue with us, with someone saying, this population in our society has a problem that deserves a societal structural solution. It, it almost seems like people are They are, are because they think that they'll lose something. People are... Somehow... Why do you think that is? I don't, I do not Neither understand do the psychology. But somehow people believe, <laughs> fundamentally believe that by allowing black people the right to exist as human and to have all of the same rights and opportunities that they're somehow going to lose out. And it makes no sense. Like, there's enough yeah, sun I, in the yeah, world that, for all just, of us. I just don't get it. You know, like, <laughs> if I stand outside in the sun and sunbathe, it's not going to hurt the person standing next to me. Like, I'm not taking the sun from them. Well, and the other thing I know, I guess I don't understand is it makes financial sense. If you right. have fewer poor people right. and they have good jobs, that means they'll buy houses, right. buy cars, raise children, mm -hmm. spend money, pay taxes. This it makes does. economic sense. This is America. One of the few things we think. do well is make money. How does this, like how it, does this not make sense to be kind of like, let's get these people making money because right. all, everyone will benefit. You know, the other I got in this huge argument on Twitter <laughs> that I eventually gave up on. Because the Biden, the Biden transition office 
came out and said that in the next round of help for businesses, they particularly want to make sure the help gets to minority right. and women-owned businesses. Wonderful, fantastic, awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> early days, yeah, early days. We have six days to get to inauguration. We'll see what happens. But, and I've ha- I had this whole argument about how somehow helping minority and woman-owned businesses was somehow racist. <laughs> that the word minority itself was racist and that the, it should be a help for all businesses and not just businesses of a specific population. And I explained, these businesses, they don't have banking connections, they may not have the staff to file the paperwork to get loans, there's all these barriers, mm-hmm. this is a great and wonderful idea. I thought I was being you very are. reasonable. But you would, <laughs> well, you probably wouldn't be, surprised at the vitriol that I got for saying, I think this is generally speaking <laughs> probably a good idea. I, I don't understand this fear, but I agree with you. It's because people are afraid right. they're going to lose out on something. And I, I, I Because it's not true. It that it's not the truth. And I, what I don't understand is why people are, are so struggling with saying, mm-hmm. yes, we're going to help business, but because these businesses have a particular concern, we're going to make an extra right. effort to help them. We're mm-hmm. still helping all businesses. We're just making sure that those who have the hardest time getting to the help get a little right. bit more help to get to the help. I don't see how this is incompatible with the rest of the program. But people just don't want to see it because they're so caught up in, you know, the individualism, you know, that drives this country that, you know, we shouldn't be reliant on assistance, even though in some shape or form, everybody receives assistance, whether or not you're benefiting from, you know, white supremacy or affirmative action or generational wealth, like nobody does anything a hundred percent on their own. No. Well, it's like I tell people when it comes to welfare, I say, do you own a home? Yes. Do you deduct your mortgage interest on your right. taxes? So yes. Welfare. We put that in there to encourage home ownership yeah. in this country. We are, the taxpayer is losing out on dollars that would otherwise be paid to make it right. effective for you to own a home. That's essentially Indeed. rich person's welfare. It's just not food stamps or health care or anything like that. You know, it's the same thing we do for businesses. Most people don't know this. The tax code has been turned Hmm. to Swiss cheese for businesses. There are so many loopholes, deductions, carried interest, depreciation, all this type of thing. How do you think Donald Mm. Trump's been getting those not paying taxes for 25 years? And all of all of that is some kind of welfare. It's the government not taking money in order to support a certain business activity. And I don't, I don't understand the discount where people don't, they don't see that yeah. being the same thing. Right. Because it doesn't take the same form. It's a very, it's a very odd, odd thing. So, all right. So when it comes, circling yes. back to the wild world of black feminism, when it comes to black feminism, moving forward for 2021 in the future, what changes in policy or the movement or in activism would you like to see moving forward? What would really move the needle on this issue? Wow, that is a who that is a good question. Um well we're we've we've gone yeah. past this inflection point. Big right. stuff has gone down. Now's the time to start having that. So what I would say is go. that I want people to really and truly listen to black women and not just to use it as a hashtag and that to understand that when you listen to black women and you believe black women, it doesn't mean giving them more work to do. Like, because we are often left carrying the bag to fix the problems that we did not create. We did not create white supremacy. We did not create sexism. These are not our problems to fix. The people with power need to fix these problems. And that is what I would like to see. 
I would also like to see black women getting paid for their time and their efforts. You want me to come and talk about, you know, black feminism to your corporation, to your class, and you're not going to give me my coins. That's a problem. You have black women. It was Tiffany Haddish who was asked to host a show and they were like, you're going to do this for free. Right. It's like, excuse me. Because we have all of this yeah. time and all of this money that we don't, you know, need this financial support. That's just not the reality. So that's what I would like to see. I would like to see people actually doing the work, not just black women, not just the people that are burdened by, you know, <laughs> these oppressions with the people who have the power to push back against them that they would actually do so and none of this talk about you know uh, what is it not even just this symbolic talk about reaching across the aisle you cannot reach across the aisle with somebody whose politics is calling for your death i have absolutely no empathy for white supremacists. I have absolutely no desire to shake hands or, you know, give a hug to a white supremacist. Why would I want to do that? This doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> we just need to really contend with the issues that yeah. exist, name them, and tear them down. Well, that actually kind of transitions to my next point because I I struggle with trying to figure out how to I guess kind of bridge the gap with where where things are going politically because politics mm -hmm. happens in the middle and there is you know on the one hand you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to negotiate with someone to whom mm. your existence is on the table. That's not going to work very well. Um, conversely, mm -hmm. we have a country to govern, and politics happens in the middle. No. And these people are not going away. Um, <coughs> God damn it. So what I'm, I guess, trying to figure out is we're going to have to mm -hmm. try to govern with these people how are we going to do that when we can't even get mm. them to acknowledge what the problem is? These are the problems I say I'm trying to figure out. And, and this, and the, I think that's, you know, kind of one of the difficulties because like when I wrote my essay on racism, it's, I started writing it because I got in a fight with someone because he was mad about, I was so, a couple years ago and I think Black Lives Matter had just come around and he had gotten very mad at me and he's kind of like I don't you know yes I'm white but I came from a poor family and I don't want to be compared to being a, a you know a slave owner or a plantation owner I said that's all fine and well but the reality is that the system right. is built to benefit you and not me it is <clears throat> this is a huge problem and it and it sure as hell was not built to benefit my father who was Basically. the son of a sharecropper in Alabama for God's sake so I guess like this is a huge, huge problem. Um, and I, I went home and I recounted that conversation. And then I started writing actually about all the ways in which our society is mm -hmm. racist towards all sorts of other groups of people. Um, and then got back around to us and said, here's how right. these structures got set up and why. And I feel like we're going to, we're going to keep running into that problem again of it's going to be so hard to get people to acknowledge these harms in society because if they acknowledge that something is wrong, that means we've got to hold people to be accountable, accountable for those problems. <laughs> Eggs, that's you took the words out of my mouth. And then I'll, there's a lot of people who are very disinterested in being held accountable mm -hmm. for all these systems that are put in place. So I guess if you had five minutes with you know, Biden and Harris, well, I guess, what would you, what would you suggest? How are they going to govern a country when a non-zero number mm -hmm. of Congress critters have allied themselves with Ooh. white supremacists? 
I mean, you know, name it, call it what it is. Let just be honest and don't try and sugarcoat it. Like we see the truth, we see the reality, but we have to make changes for the better. And I'm still like really struggling with this idea that like I want so many of these people in jail while at the same time hating the prison system itself. So it's it's complicated. And I recognize that it's complicated, but there are some things that aren't complicated. Critical race theory is not a threat to the United States. Diversity training is not a threat to the United States, period. Um, white supremacy is a threat to the United <clears throat> States. So I think that if I had five minutes to talk to them is I would say, can we just state these facts fundamentally and try and move forward? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm getting a lot of, a lot of pushback from people who are unhappy with, you know, the ideas of critical race mm -hmm. theory all this sort of thing, um, who are unhappy with the amount of time and energy that's being spent on diversity training, all this type of thing. It, it, does, not, it does not appear to have reached that point where it has become popular right. enough that people have begun to accept it. And, 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 and there's a whole group of people who are making a lot of money crusading against Ugh. woke culture yeah. and cancel culture and all this type of thing. Um, what point do you think we have to get to where this stuff becomes mainstream and people begin to accept it Ooh. as part of society and part of life? Because <clears throat> I, think, I think we are probably hmm. five to ten years away. Oh, definitely. It's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Now. It's definitely not going to happen magically on January 20th. Like, it's going to take no. decades. Yeah. No, one, one famous Facebook comment I read years ago had to do with trans people. And this guy said, I don't really mind trans people. I just don't want to be told what to think about it. And I think that's where a lot of people are, is they feel like the way they understand the world is being attacked. And, and, for, human, and for humans in the human brain, that's a tough place to be in. Because we rely on having... <clears throat> a model of how the world works in order to conceive right. reality so we know how to act in the world. And when people come along and try to completely change that, that's it really is. hard. It is. Uh, what's it's more difficult. difficult is living um, your life and wondering if you're going to be shot just for existing. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, yeah, on the other, the other side of that coin is you know, every time you're a person of color, you're getting pulled over by the police, right. that is a life or death situation. You know, right. even the police just passing by casually exactly. can be a life or death situation. Uh, yeah, and that's, and, that's, and that's where I, and that's why I say it's going to be so long and we're going to get so many more arguments and so many more issues, bef you know, trying to handle this, this woke culture thing. And, and trying to reconceive our society to be actually inclusive right. of all people, not just pretending to be, sort of thing. Um, yeah, I guess what's, you know, what's your, what's your view on the, the rise and rise of so-called woke <laughs> culture? What do you think about all oh, that? Oh, that would take me a million years to say. I just, you know, like, I think people should do the reading before they claim any type of anything. And I'm not just saying like reading the academic books. I just mean like in general, <laughs> pay attention to the pulse of the situation. And that's what I mean by do the reading. Like, yeah, you can say you're woke, but it's like one of those, it's like the same thing as like, you don't get to name yourself an ally. Like you can't claim that identity. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like, like you, like you yeah. can work towards I, being an ally. That, that's one like of the you can say that I do my best to be mm -hmm. an ally, but like you don't know what harm you're causing to communities unless those communities tell you. 
And I think that that's just something that we have to recognize. You know, that, that's very true. I get very frustrated because some of my fans, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, but some of my fans are huge fans of yeah, me. They see, never yeah, see, and that's a problem. <laughs> that's a huge problem. And, and it's, like, it's like, I get you enjoy like the podcast and you, you enjoy the clever tweets and all that type of thing. And that's cool. But there's the lack of knowledge by a lot of these right. people is deeply troubling to me. And it's like, if, you know, it's, it's like if you think I'm cool and you like what I do, but you've never taken five minutes right. to read anything I've actually written down, that's a, that's a, that's a big problem. And, and it's just, and, and it so, gets so frustrating because it's like, oh my goodness, I'm sitting here trying to explain this to you. I literally wrote a whole book about this. <laughs> like, or I have a whole essay in one of my books about this. Or I did a whole huge article in my blog or another publication about this please read <laughs> like it's we'll consume the exactly. information faster than we can have intelligent conversation about it like you know sort of thing um and when i was involved in occupy i found that very frustrating the lack of intellectual um mm -hmm. rancor of people i found deeply troubling and i i kind of made an effort at the time to fix some of that by trying to you know summarize my bachelor's degree in a, you know, faster, easier to consume pieces of information yeah. for people. Um, and I, and people just kind of generally just kind of weren't interested. So I, I totally see that. I mean, I agree. Yeah. There's an education piece that has to happen and people have to engage and read and educate themselves and then right. move out into the world. And that's, and I, I can see that in my own following. Right, because it's like, people. if you've this never read huge, anything of critical problem. race theory, I just feel like you shouldn't speak. Like, because you don't know what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I enjoy at this stage, um, I, I enjoy the conversations about critical race theory because I find it fascinating yeah the inferences right. and the perspectives other people have on it. Um, that in the case exactly. of some people are not grounded in reality. <laughs> right. I'm like, you that had all that and got there. Oh, like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a, that's a journey. And I'm not quite sure how you took that <laughs> journey, but that's a journey, buddy. Um, yeah, that's, um, you know, that's a very difficult, a very difficult sort of thing. And, and I, because, because it, again, I'm, I'm stuck in between worlds. So I, <laughs> and, and it's, it's kind of a very disconcerting sort of thing. Like I, I kind of yeah. go hang out with the racists from time to time because I grew up in a white world. I have lots of white friends, all this sort of thing. And, and people say Wild. shit in front of me. <laughs> like it's very not great. Yeah, it's it's not great. And and it's it's very interesting to hear kind of the unfiltered <laughs> coffee orange juice of what people think about this stuff. And it's just I, I'm there are some times where I someone will actually have some learned and valid criticisms and all that sort of thing. And I'm like, okay, I right. don't agree with you, but I get your perspective and you clearly read something about it. Cool. Right. At least we can have intelligent conversation about it. But then, then there's the people right. where it's like, they only read the headline. That's all they read. And that, those are the people that I, 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 I struggle with. So I guess mm -hmm. as a closer, cause we're getting close to time. How, how do we handle how do we handle the headline readers? How how do we deal with those people who read one negative headline about something racial one time mm -hmm. ten days ago, and are now going on a whole crusade? Of like, course. how do we? Because we're going to confront this in social media. We're going to confront this all. How? What are some suggestions of things to do when this sort of thing comes up? 
that might help right. us in our future battles wisely. Battles. Like you don't have to engage <laughs> because, with everyone all the time because yeah. it will exhaust you. <laughs> your time is your time and you use it the way that you see fit. You can't change everybody's mind. So don't try. <laughs> like, and if you're engaging in social media yes, and people true. are just there to troll and not listen, that's why they invented the block function. Like, use it, <laughs> use it, use it, use it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I always never used to block people because I'm like, well, right. this is my public account. I'm a public person. You know, I should never block people, all this sort of thing. Right. Protect I, your I, peace. I've that. And sometimes protecting your peace <laughs> means blocking a person or yeah, three I've my or a dozen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th there's a lot of conversations I remove myself from. I don't. Right. I, 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 I used to be, I would stay in there, you know, and I really would go for, and I, I don't. It's like mm, this gone. This right. this back and forth has gone on for ten tweets. I'm done. Like nope. we're good. I'm not right. changing any minds today. So it's time to move on. You know. Yeah, because it does. Uh, and that's. I think one of the mm -hmm. things that people of color go through. At least I know I go through. Is it's like not only do I have to deal of being a large brown queer Ooh. man in a world that has no value for me, which is fine. Um, but then on top of that, it's like, then, then anytime anyone mm -hmm. has, and every black person has had this happen to them, anytime anyone has any question about race, right. you suddenly become the ambassador for all black people. It does, but very quickly. That gets yeah. very exhausting, <laughs> very quickly. Yeah, and, and for me, it gets, it gets depressing. My depression can flare up. It can, yeah. you know, it can get real bad. And that's, you know, a whole other set of problems. So it's like, all these things are piling on and it's like, For well, sure. it is no wonder we have mental health issues in the community. There's a lot of stuff piling on, you know, it's very, it's very difficult. So, all right. Well, do you have any closing <laughs> remarks for us? Any no closing problem. thoughts? I talked way too yeah. much. I apologize. It was very, very, way too much. I was just so excited to talk to you because this is very rarely do I get to engage on this sort of <laughs> thing with someone who is an expert in it. So I had a lot to say, but, what any parting words on the yeah. ideas of black feminism or engaging with BLM or engaging with communities? Definitely. Whatever well, you, thank you for you know, having me. I guess with. my closing words would be, you know, read the work of the Kambahi River Collective first, marinate in it. And, you know, just understand mm. that black feminism isn't white feminism and blackface. It's, its own distinct, mm. unique framework and ideology. And it is not monolithic. There are multiple black feminisms. So engage as much as you will. And, you know, just think critically. Always think critically. That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners, so please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Fallon on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal Podcast.